Well, I was wondering, I would like to thank you for doing this thing I think is very important and uh, you told us yesterday that maybe you have uh, money for doing uh, next year next year again. So it could be very nice to to maintain this little forum here and uh, get some good things to take it back to the to your country and uh, that's why that's what I'm going to do the next 15 minutes. As Gordon said, uh, Denmark is not perfect, it's far from perfect. But we have had some good successes in the last year and uh, I'm going to tell you about one success and how we managed to to get to achieve our goal. Uh, the presentation is called Fisheries Management on the island of Fiji. I'm going to show you where this island is, and uh, we want to think that it's a new trend in the way of regulating fisheries in Denmark because it's a very good way of doing it. They are taking uh, a lot of new things into account, and we are very keen on. Persuade that way because we think that uh, assume that way because we think the minister and and Denmark is, is ready for uh, make a change. My name is Paul. Uh, work in the Danish Sports Fishing Association as a as a biologist. Uh, my job is to create the good fishing work with the uh, water course restoration and the fisheries policy. Okay. I'm going to tell you about Fyn, but uh, since we have Americans here who think that Denmark is the capital of Sweden, I'm going to show you this little country here is Denmark, a very small one, 44,000 square kilometers, and a more than 5 million inhabitants. And as Christian said, we are, some anglers, I think we're a little more than Christian because I count the, the kids under 18 and the older ones major than 65 years old. So we have a little more than 600,000, as Christian said. And I guess we have about 170,000 dedicated anglers, at least they're the one who buy the national angling license. So, well, it's about uh, 10 to 15 percent like in, in, in all other countries. And the most popular species we have in Denmark is the sea trout. Uh, it's a fantastic fish. It grows up to about, uh, well, the biggest one we ever caught in Denmark was caught in Gilnet. Sorry for that, but it was caught. Uh, north of Zealand, it, it was 110 centimeters and, and weighed without the, the stomach content or anything. It was, I don't know what, all the intest, intestine, intestines, yes. It weighed 18.5 kilos. It was, been, it was the world record. And we looked at the scales and it was a sea trout. It wasn't a salmon. It's very popular. I think about 35 to 40 percent of the Danes are, are fishing for this species in salt water in the rivers. and. Uh, mostly in salt water. We have, because we have so many kilometers of shoreline, uh, more than 7,000, and the only part you don't fish for sea trout is this western part because it's too windy and uh, too much sand. All, all, all the other places in Denmark can catch sea trout. So it's, it's a fantastic country for sea trout. The, the water level is very, it's very shallow, it's pretty uh, hard to compare to other places, so the temperature is almost perfect for sea trout all year long. And you have a lot, lot of the uh, uh, prawns and, and so on, a lot of, lot of food for the sea trout. Yes. And uh, we catch a lot of sea trout. In Denmark, when we uh, evaluated the last time, we caught more than 1.2 million sea trout on, on rod, that's fishing or angling, of which 80% <coughs> were released. So it's like in the States and Canada, we release a lot of them, and what we catch a lot of them in Denmark. And uh, we catch mostly Danish sea trout, even though we catch sea trout from all over the, the Baltic area here and from Norway as well, but uh, mostly Danish sea trout. And the Danish sea trout are caught in Norway, are caught in Gotland and so on, so they're spread all over this area, the Danish stocks. Just to show you different kind of sea trout, different kind of coasts, it's a as I said, a wonderful fish. This is from the island of Bornholm. It's a fantastic island here in the middle of the Baltic. Fantastic islands with only with the wild sea trout. In general, the, the Danish stocks is about 20% of the of the full potential. So we're doing a lot of stocking program using only <coughs> wild fish. These that's pretty good, but we have a very, very big potential for, for raising the level. And uh, this was a good day, not for him, him alone, but for three other guys. So it was maybe it looks a little too much, but that could happen in Denmark in one hour fishing. Oh, sorry, for the way. 
And uh, this is uh, Christian Scope fishing here, and he caught that fish in one haul more than three kilos. So we catch a lot of nice big sea trout. And when you look at the fins, you can see that it's a wild sea trout. We do that a lot in Denmark when we fish. If you catch a fish with a sea trout, with, it has uh, small failures. Uh, it's a it's a stuck sea trout, and you can you are allowed to kill it. In my point of view, even though it's just 41 centimeters with minimum size 40 centimeters, if you catch a big sea trout, maybe you should, you should let it go because it's in in my point of view an endangered species in many areas. Okay, now we're going to the Howell Fun project, the sea trout Fun project. This is Fun, an island of about uh, 5,000 square kilometers, a lot of islands, the right nice place here in the middle of Denmark. And they had this angling project more than 20 years now. And uh, they stock sea trout, about half a million. They invest in uh, restoring rivers, uh, create uh, passage in rivers and so on. And they uh, use about um, 400,000 euros and then they generate 5 million euros. They have uh, 68,000 68, hotel nights and 28 full-time jobs. That doesn't maybe sound too convincing, but to this area it's very important because it's the municipalities over here in those area, close to the coast, that's, that gets the money. In Denmark we have this uh, part called, that we call it the rotten banan, banana, because it uh, starts like this, go over here, and it's all the mun municipalities who doesn't uh, have uh, too much money because they lost uh, the industry, they close down the factories, the, the level of education is pretty low, so they don't have too much uh, to do, but they have very good fishing in this area. So we, I don't call it the rotten banana, I call it the green banana, because it, it has very good potential for these green projects here. And it, it's a, it's a well-defined, well-described project, and it works, works very well. And uh, these guys on food, they made an estimation of what one sea trout is worth. And they found out by combining different uh, investigations, different surveys, that it's worth almost 600 euro. And that's funny because it's almost the same amount you get when you evaluate the value of salmon in Ireland, in Norway, Sweden, and so on. So on, it's almost about that size. And that number is very good to remember. It's so good that even our minister of the fishery, Dan Jørgensen, a week ago, he went to television to say that uh, the, um, the value for one sea trout caught by an angler is that amount. And then um, afterwards, I just received a, an email yesterday that uh, the Danish television has a program called Detector. And they are evaluating uh, things that politicians claim. And uh, they are looking into that number, yeah. I don't hope it gets too much trouble for it because, I'm, in fact, it was me founder set them up for the first time and so the idea to the guys on the field. So I'll go down with him. And I think I think the number is all right. I hope so. Okay, it's worth a lot of money. We have this Ormsefjord, Ormsefjord here in the northern part, and it's here you have the big uh, tackle yards. You the most people live. It's the fourth. Uh, biggest uh, city of Denmark, about uh, 250,000 people. So this area is very important, Odense Fjord. And we have a lot of trouble here because uh, we have uh, small small rivers coming into, or small streams coming into, and they have to pass all this way here, through the fjord, out uh, to the uh, feeding grounds here in, in the, the ocean. And uh, here in this area, we had we have two semi-commercial semi fishermen, semi commercial means that they have another job besides the fishing job. So they don't have to earn too much money to be able to, to have that status. And they are, they are allowed to, feel, to fish with 2.5 kilometers of gill nets. And then we have a lot of the recreational gill net fishers who are allowed to fish <coughs> each 150 meters of gill nets and that gives them many kilometers of gill nets. Of course they do not, do not fish at the same time everyone, so it's just a theoretical value, but if they all go out fish the same day, they could, they could easily kill the entire fjord. And uh, we tried to, we didn't like that. Uh, one friend of mine went out to fish one day and uh, he hooked up a, a net, gill net, and the guy 
playing uh, half kilometer away, he came by, it, it, it was the owner of the geomat. And my, my friend didn't see uh, the flags because it was 1.2 kilometers long, so the flag was over there and he didn't see what happened. So he called the gilnet and the guy came over and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I, let me pay for your gilnet and so on. And then they started to talk because they were, the fisherman was, uh, the angler was polite and the other one didn't want to So they started to talk and said, oh, I see you have a lot of fish in your boat. How many sea trout have you caught this year? Uh, my friend asked, and the other one said, "Oh, I have about 60 here, and uh, but it's, it's been a bad day, so uh, I maybe caught more than 1,000 this year." And uh, he came back, told the story to his friends, and so on. And it's, well, it annoyed us a lot because we know that one sea trout worth caught by an angler is worth about 600 euro. I went in to see how much did this, this guy sell, in fact, and the same period when he caught at least. Uh, thousand sea trout. He sold only eight kilos, so it was black sea trout, and it's not. It's worth worth nothing for the for the sea trout funeral project. So it started a lot of trouble, and uh, we had to deal with that. And uh, to prove to the local politicians that those skillness is a, could be a problem, we made those uh, maps here. Here we have the migration route. Uh, here we have sandbars, very shallow water on both sides. We know that the sea trout travel this way out from the river out to the open sea. And if you place just five uh, smaller gillnets, uh, you know the one that uh, the recreational fishers are allowed to use, you can place it like this and you can catch almost the entire population. And if you point, put, uh, put your 1.2 kilometers gillnet here, well, Nothing left. Uh, that was the most southern part. If you go a little more north, the same problem. And we could show with these maps that potentially we have a very big problem. And we saw the guy with a lot of sea trout in his boat. So um, we started to, to think, think, what can we do about it? Because we know that it's very difficult to, if you have a commercial uh, interests uh, against our interests, they always win. They used to win at least. What did we do? We created a small group consisting of four members of the steering group from uh, the Sea Trout Funeral Project and one employee. And then we uh, took one member from the tap shops. It's very important because the tap shops in this Owen Street is very important, it's very big, and he has a very good name. And then we took some two local anglers, and then I participated in the group as well. And then we sat down. And uh, we made a strategy, and this started in 2010. It took us four years to get to the point where we had a good result. So we used the media for a long time. We talked to the radios, we talked to television and so on. Started uh, describing uh, the bad thing that one or two guys could ruin it for the whole uh, sea, sea trout uh, project in Fyn. And we talked to the local politicians and talked to the members of the parliament and uh, we had we normally meet the Danish Minister of Fishery uh, two times a year, and every time we met with her, we talked about the situation. And uh, yeah, at, at last we made an impact. But what really uh, helped us a lot was when we asked the DTU where Christian is working. We asked them to make an evaluation of the possible consequences. Negative, of course, because we didn't want to have the positive consequences. But the negative consequences for the migration for the sea trout between the spawning areas in fresh water and the marine feeding habitats. We wanted them to write this could potentially be a problem, even though we don't know the amount of fish they, they catch. It, we can see on the maps, because of the sandbars and the, the physical conditions of the fjord, that it is potentially a very big problem. We didn't meet, need more than that. We didn't need the, the warp gun. We just needed them to write its potential problem. And uh, then, after two and a half years, they, uh, they came with a proposal of a new regulation in the fjords. And they said, instead of fishing with uh, three nets all over <coughs> this area, you're only allowed to fish with one gill net in this area. And the semi-commercial and the commercial fishermen are not allowed to fish in this area. And, and that was a, a kind of success because we reduced the, the fishing with 66% and we 
we could be satisfied. But I wasn't satisfied because I said, all right, we have maybe solved the problem here, but we have 200 persons who can fish with one, one uh, net, and that's enough to kill the entire stock. And if you don't, you're not allowed to fish here, you can fish in this area, the, the most northern part of the fjord. So we just moved the problem out here, so we didn't like it. And then we contacted the, the recreational, recreational fishermen because they didn't like the idea of just fishing with one, with one uh, gillnet. They wanted to fish with three. But then we said, all right, let's talk about it. What, what do you want and what do you need and how can we meet? And then we made an agreement. We, they agreed no sea trout gillnet in the southern part. No, sea, no gillnet for sea trout. But you're allowed to fish with gillnets designed for flat fish. <coughs> And uh, you know, the, the, the gillnets for sea trout are more than two meters high and they float in the surface. When you fish with gillnets for flat fish, you feel it's 1.2 meters and, it, and when you catch your fish, you just lay down on the, on the bottom. So it won't catch sea trout, at least not very many. Um, and, uh, and they, of course, uh, agreed as well that uh, the commercial anglers are, should not operate in this area, nor in this area as well, because it was in, in their interest as well. So, this, we agreed, they agreed with us that this entire fjord should in fact be a recreational fjord, and the most southern part should only, uh, the trout should not be caught in gillnets. That was our proposal that we, which we sent to the minister. Of course, we talked to the politicians and so on, and they supported us. And uh, the final result was that here in the southern part of Oontafjord, no sea trout in this area. It's fantastic. It's the first time ever in Denmark we had uh, quit all the gillnets for sea trout. Uh, and no gillnet uh, fishery in the southern part at all from the 1st of November to the 1st of May, meaning that in this area there will be no gillnet at all, not even for flatfish. So that's fantastic as well. And you are allowed to fish with three gillnets designed for flatfish in this area, the southern part, and you are only allowed to fish with three gillnets in the most northern part, meaning that the commercial fishers and the semi-commercial fishers cannot fish, fish with 1.2 kilometers. So this entire fjord is now a recreational <coughs> fjord for angling and using gillnets, mostly for flatfish. So that was the result. And what did you learn about it? You know, think tank takes time, and even though anglers claim that they are very patient, they are not. They want results right now, and they were pressing a lot because when I said to them, we need to uh, make a plan, we need to be very careful not to go too fast forwards because then we lose the case, and it took four years. Uh, but since we, before we start the, the process, we talked about it said it would take at least three or four years. So they agreed on that. But and things take time. We have to work with the minister, we have to work with the municipalities and so on. And of course we have to use the media the media a lot, like we've done in Finland and Sweden and so on. It's, it's the only way to get out to the the normal people who doesn't know anything about but they know they don't know about fishing, but they know about uh, nonsense. It's nonsense that one man can kill the entire party in one floor. And if you don't have political contacts, get them. If, it was pretty funny because the political contact we had, he, he was not a member of the Danish parliament, but uh, in the process, there was an election. And uh, even though he didn't come from the island of Fyland, and he was uh, standing uh, he was part of the party, which is uh, the party for the, the farmers. And he was not a farmer. He comes from Copenhagen, and he's a very smart guy. And he was the fourth or the, the third on the list. He was not supposed to be to have been elected. But he was elected because he had this good case that he got involved in. So it's, it's a very good way to, to be popular if you're, if you're a politician. And I think a lot of politicians know about that now. So use them. And of course, you have to co-work with everyone, not not just your friends, uh, all kinds that can uh, 
tribute to the to the, the good case you have to use, and uh, even though even though you don't agree on anything, use them. And of course, it's very important to use the tapestry of the tourist agencies and so on, because that's what uh, rises this case to the next level. And this is the first time we've done that in Denmark. Use the socio-economic socio value uh, to achieve this goal. It's the first time ever, and we succeeded. And of course, we are planning to do it the next time and the next time again without any hesitation. Uh, we'll use it, and the minister has already told us two or three times last week that he believed in those numbers. I don't know if I believe in them, even though I found out I made them up myself. But, you know, it's so very important that we uh, have value for the fishing and so on. So, thank you for your attention and uh, keep on fishing with me.